excitement, our bewilderment with God. Let's read that passage. Acts 16, verse 6 to 10. We're carrying on our, our series through the book of Acts. Let's, uh, let's continue with that as we think about what it means to be constructively bewildered by God. <laughs> um, we pick up things in verse 6 of chapter 16. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What an interesting passage. This might be one of the strangest passages we'll look at as we go through the book of Acts, I would say. So what do we see? A little bit of background first. They're on the move as usual. Well, that was our passage. They're on the move. Where are they going to? So Paul and, uh, and, uh, and everybody have been down in Jerusalem. They're now, we, last week we were talking about picking up Timothy, Iconium, and Lystra. And now they're moving roughly through this kind of route, through this area called Phrygia, this area called Bithynia, there's Galatia mentioned here, Mycenae is mentioned, Troas, and then Macedonia. Now we're not going to get to Macedonia this week because that's coming, but that, that's mentioned here. So that's the flow of what Paul and his companions are doing. That's where they are. Yes, it's modern day Turkey now. That's right, this area, modern day Turkey. So that's what's going on. And they're on the move. Paul and his friends are on the move, which if you know Paul and his friends and his habits, that's pretty normal for Paul, right? He doesn't seem to stand still for very long. And in our lives, just to make the spiritual point, if you like for us to be considering, sometimes, it seems to me like most of our lives, when we're healthy, thinking healthily about our lives, we are also, in a sense, on the move. And sometimes that's geographical, like is being illustrated here. But sometimes we're on the move internally. God's doing things. So we're going to be talking about that helpful disturbance that God does for us and keeps us moving. We'll talk about that as we go on today. They are traveling in, in the section we're talking about here, probably about 200 miles or more. So there's a lot of journey. Now, I don't particularly like even driving 200 miles, if I, unless I have to. But imagine, imagine walking 200 miles. What's that Proclaimers song? Five hundred miles. Like five hundred miles. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I don't know about five hundred. I don't know about two hundred. This is a lot of journey. And the point I want to make at the beginning about that is this is not just an overnight thing. It's not just a short day. This, this is a big part of their life. This is a big part of their day, their their week, their month, their year uh, of what God is is doing here. And there are a lot of weird things going on in this passage. I mean, weird at least on one level, right? The Holy Spirit is doing things. The Spirit of Jesus is doing things. There's a vision. There's a man standing and begging. I mean, all kinds of strange things going on. And we could well ask, what is God doing? And I'm sure that Paul and his companions were asking the same questions. We're trying to go here. It's not going to work. We're trying to go here. That's not going to work. We have a weird vision. What? God, what are you doing? And that's rather reassuring. Because sometimes I think we think about when the disciples were with Jesus, or in the early days of the church, when the Holy Spirit seemed to be so present and powerful, surely it was simpler. You knew what God was doing. But actually, it was no more simple and clear to them than I think than it often is to us today. What is God doing? Well, the question I have in my mind is, since I think they were quite bewildered, I think I would have been, by what's going on, as it became clearer and clearer, eventually, but still it was quite bewildering, I think they must have been asking, what is God doing? And then, is there a way to enjoy the, the journey? Is there a, a way to find uh, joy in the bewilderment that God is, is uh, allowing here? In what sense might bewilderment be helpful and even necessary for us in the Christian life? 
And that's kind of the question I've been mulling over with this. How might bewilderment by God be helpful and be even necessary in my Christian life, in our Christian lives? So we're going to talk about two things today. First of all, we notice that in this passage, God closes doors and God opens doors. That's clear. God is, oh yeah, so that's what happens to me when I'm bewildered. <laughs> so I feel somewhat like that. What is God doing? Let's get rid of that image. Um, God closes some doors and God opens some doors, right? Sometimes God does things in a sense negatively. Like for us as a congregation, we tried to get the Croxley building, the, the old Explore building in Croxley, not once, but twice. We tried to get it the first time with the church growth trust and the second time to see if we could sublease it off uh, Christ first that now had the building. We, we tried twice and God said no twice. That's, that's kind of a closed door, isn't it? I think that's a closed door. I think God closed it. I think. I would trust that. God said no. And what's the conclusion of that? Well, at least part of the conclusion of that must be that God prefers us to be scattered more than he needs us to be centered geographically. Now we are scattered geographically, but you see what I mean? It seems to me that God is saying not that we need to focus on West Rockford, we need to focus on our home-based ministry, on our household ministries, whilst having a base in West Watford, for sure, and having an impact in West Watford, well, of course, why not? But this isn't our focus. If you have a building, it's much more that's your focus. Mm -hmm. But God says no to a building for us, at least right now, which must mean that he's saying, no, you need to be household focused. And I would like to encourage us, this is my, isn't my main point today, but I'd like to encourage us to be thinking now about what that might mean for 2020 for your household. It's October, it's mid-October. Uh, it will almost, it will be Christmas before you know it. I'm planning the Christmas carol service now, right? You have to, right? But what about next year? What, what, might, what door might God open? If you shut that door, what door might God be opening? for you to be effective for the kingdom of God using your household as the focus. We have a base here, but it's not our focus. The thing's a big difference. You don't have to have your focus and your base in the same place. So just a thought for us to be thinking and praying about what that might mean for next year. So sometimes it's negative in a sense. Sometimes the guidance is positive. And God opens a door, and we've seen that in our own lives. So what I'm going to ask us to do now for a minute is to talk to a couple of people near you, so like huddle up with three, two, three, four people, and have a discussion about how you, now you look back on, maybe even now, but you look back on your life as a Christian. What are some incidences where God shut doors or opened them? When you, can you look back and say, now I look back, I can see God shut that door, but another time he opened that door. If you can't think of one, that's okay, but you can think about your life, you can talk about your life and talk about God, and uh, think about ideas in the Bible, examples of that if you like. But just take a few moments. I'm going to give us, um, I'm going to give us two minutes. Shall I stretch, stretch it to three? No, I think three. We need three minutes. Three. I'm going to give you three minutes to think about times when God has opened doors and closed doors. We'll take a couple of those. Anybody would like to share one? I'll give you a good one. Four. Right. Getting married for many years, finding your wife, get involved. And I think God made that. They're meeting someone else who's a very religious person, my new wife, as I told you, mm. who's, who's so religious, it's unbelievable. Her family are all religious in the Church of Christ. That's what I closed the door and opened the door for me. That's how I come into religion. For Jenny, who's now the same, you see, Reverend Jeffrey Bone, who knows more about me, helping me through, through God. You know, I was very upset losing my children, going to court, Obviously, it's a suicide. Jeffrey helped me. He said, Paul, don't worry. You divorce, you get the call. It's gone, it's finished. You'll definitely meet someone else. And I did. Marrying someone who's very religious would get me in. And I say, I'd really like you to, uh, to meet her. She works in the Philippines. Her family are top ministers. She's a government official. Church every day, every day, every day. So one day we hope to meet her. Well, she doesn't want to come to me because she uh, doesn't want to change her mind. mind. <laughs> <laughs> she would like you to come to oh, the We can pray for that. <laughs> I don't think we'll see. But thank you. So we God, God, God used 
her to open a door to you to find God. Yes. What a powerful thing. Thank you very much. Good. A, a one more, maybe, or possibly two, depending on how friendly they are. Um, yes? I mean, if you have time for one more, if anybody would like to share. Patricia, go on. school door and open another school door. No, same school. Same school? Yes. Okay. Yes. The door was closed, then it was open. Yeah. Okay, go on Dan. I can't deny the best leader of songs for children that I know. When I, when I got invited at a plus one to join Andrew Reddick. Ah. Uh, I was invited at Ah, yes. And, and the significance of that? Oh, that was the last time I won. Ah. <laughs> 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 Excellent. Yes. Well, you know, isn't it? I, it's one of those things I think. When I, when I was thinking about this, I started thinking about closed doors in my life that God had closed and open doors. And for, for the first little while, I couldn't think of much. It took a while to, to, to think through my life. I mean, it's been, my life's longer than most of our lives here. So it took a while to think through, through it all. But, but, uh, but as you think back, you begin to notice where God shut doors, where God opened doors. Um, and some of them were, were fun and exciting experiences, and some were very difficult. Uh, one of the early ones for me as a relatively young Christian was Penny and I went as part of the mission team to plant our congregation in Birmingham in, in 1988. And it was exciting to go on a mission team. But once I'd been there about a week, I realized this wasn't the right place for me. And I had been praying to go on that mission team for three and a half years. Like it was a big deal to me. It, and for lots of reasons I won't share now for time, but it was a big deal. And I was there, and it was the fulfillment of a prayer, of three and a half years of prayer. And I thought, oh no, this isn't the right place. And I was miserable. And I could not work out. I'm on a mission team, and I'm miserable. That just seems fundamentally wrong on so many different levels. <laughs> But then we ended up having to pack up and move back down to, to Northwest London, as it was. And it was a di God closed that door. Now, in, as I look back on it, I think, actually, I don't know where I would be if, if I'd stayed there and I'd been more and more miserable. Maybe, and maybe that would have damaged my faith in a way that I would hope it wouldn't be. So, looks like God did something good for me there, though it was very difficult. Penny was seven months pregnant, I think at the time. And we packed all our belongings into a car, and uh, we had nowhere to stay when we went back to London. We actually had literally nowhere. We stayed with Anna Morell, some of you may know Anna. Yeah. It's now up in Edinburgh for a couple of weeks, and uh, we did eventually find someone to live. But that was a difficult closed door, but I look back on it thinking, I think God had a hand in that or something very positive. And I think about God opening doors, I think about, and this is a long story I won't tell you now, but I think Penny getting her first medical job in London, which was like a miracle, and then going back into medicine uh, 16 years ago, when all the doors opened up through, um, who was working at Northwood Park, um, what's her name? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, that lady. Yes. <laughs> I can see her face. 
Anyway, <clears throat> someone who was a nurse who was in the church and was in Norfolk Park, and uh, and just it just all opened up, and, and it was a government scheme at just the right time for a narrow window for planning to retrain. And then there was a mistake they made in the admissions procedure where she was supposed to go to this hospital and end up at that one, but that one was better. I mean, there's such a long list of things. It's bizarre how it wasn't one open door; it was like a cascade of open doors. <laughs> I think more recently, that's for you, Lisa. God shut the door in Austria, he shut the door in Dublin, he shut the door in, I don't know, yeah. Yeah. everywhere, <laughs> see? And God opened the door in Watford! Yay! Yes. 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 <laughs> I mean... He shut the door on all the holidays we were planning in the next year or so. <laughs> <laughs> in all these exotic locations. <laughs> That's good. You know, it's, it's a funny thing how... But in the process, here's the thing though, right? in the process, before you can look back and see that God was opening it or closing the door, it's quite bewildering. Where is this going? Why is God doing this? And the shut doors can feel really annoying when they're doors you want to have open. And the open doors sometimes can feel quite scary because that may not be the door you wanted to go through. I wonder how Paul felt about going to Macedonia instead of these other places. I mean, because that's in Europe. Yeah. He probably wasn't, wouldn't have turned it Europe in those days, but it's a whole nother region of the world. Surely he would have been a lot more comfortable and he might think more effective staying in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we got this sometimes we've got to deal with the resentment perhaps of God closing the door. We've also got to deal with the fear of God opening the door. That might not be the one we want. So I've got a question for us to think about, just for a minute. Um, for us to think about in terms of Paul and his, his companions. When you look back at the passage here in chapter 16, what do you see in Paul and his companions in the way that they responded to these closed doors and the open door? What stands out to you? Have a look here back in chapter 16. They travel, they're kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching, they try to enter Bithynia, Jesus won't let them, they go to Troas to see the vision, and then they decide to go on. So what do you see in them? If you were there, what would you be exercising here? What would you be living out? What would you be having to deal with? What would you say? What do you see in Paul and his companions, at least in it by implication, if not directly stated? Stephanie? Yeah, really surrendered life. Surrendered. Surrendered life. All right, they're at peace with that kind of surrender, it seems. Joe? They got ready at once. Mm. They got ready at once. Mm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they didn't investigate more things. They just got ready, yes. And I can feel that God had called them to preach the gospel. I think that's just yeah. their hearts are just mm. uh, um, visible. Yes, visible and godly. Mm. Yeah, good, okay. What else, anything else? Patricia? Um, I would just say that because they got to they got companionship, they got teamwork, yeah. you could say, in fact, because there's several of them at this point. We see that Luke joins them because you see how it turns, changes from, uh, to, from to we, right? We, where is it? we got ready in verse 10, so Luke is now with them. So there's partnership and teamwork. Good, okay. Just also on a practical um, thing, that they're, they're walking all of this. Yeah. So it's even potentially more inconvenient that they've arrived at somewhere that could have yes. taken them some days to find the door closed and then to have to, you know, where it says, um, and then they went down to Troas. Yes, correct. But yeah, so I, I think at that stage I might have done a little bit of that. Mind you? Well, Possibly. I can't quite imagine. It, but... Okay, I'll take, your, I'll take your word for it. Yeah. I forgot not to just make it clear in the beginning. <laughs> was it cold and then it was very well? Because my wife hates cold, so she just hates it more. Possibly, I don't know. Uh, anything else? Anything else stand out? I did notice that um, Paul had some sort of, uh, really some right to protection 
in Macedonia, so it's, it was never by then a Roman province. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Yes, so he'd have had some rights that he wouldn't have had elsewhere. Mm. All right. Okay, three things that come to me, not saying they're the only things. Um, they explored, they persevered, and they decided. When the, some doors were shut, they didn't stop exploring. They didn't stop persevering. They persevered, and when the time came to decide something that was in their hands to decide. Some things, it seems, were not in their hands to decide. Because the Holy Spirit gave them some instructions, the Spirit of Jesus gave them others, and then the vision offered them a choice because they still had to decide, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems to me these might be three things for us to consider when God is closing doors and opening doors. Mm -hmm. Three things for us to consider by faith. How did Paul and his companions respond to God opening and closing doors? Firstly, they kept on exploring. They kept moving. They didn't stop and say, right, well, that's it. That's the way it's going to be, God. If you close the door, I'm just going to sit here and wait. They kept moving, didn't they? Yeah. Verse 6, they traveled. Verse 7, they came to the border. Verse 7a, they tried to enter. Verse 8, they passed by and they went down. They were continuing to move, continuing to explore. The question for us to think about, if God's closing a door or God's even opening a door, what might God be leading you to explore right now? What in your life might God be saying, explore this more? Keep moving. Don't stop. Don't give up. Perhaps it's a spiritual quality you've been, you've been praying about developing this year. Maybe a fruit, one of the, part of the fruit of the Spirit that you said, God, I want to grow in this. Well, are you continuing to explore it? Maybe it's hard. It's hard to change. It can be hard, even with the power of Jesus in us. You know, old habits die hard, they're kind of hardwired into us on some level. Are you continuing to explore? You got some challenge in your life, are you continuing to explore? Some prayer that hasn't been answered, are you continuing to explore? Not just being passive and waiting for God to do something you know, like that. Continuing to explore. And with the persevering, I love the way that they don't give up. They're in Phrygia, Galatia, the province of Asia, they go to Mycenae, they go through Bithynia, and then they go to Troas, and then we know they're going to go on to Macedonia. I mean, they, they, are, they are not giving up. Come on, God, what's next? It's not that way. Okay, it's that way. It's not that way. It's that way. It's not there. We're not, we're not even staying here to start a church. Just surely Troas needs a church. We are here. Why don't we start this one? Then we'll go to Macedonia. Like, no, no, we're going to... We're going to they're persevering in discovering what God has in mind for them. They it's, what was going to happen in Macedonia. So they might not be. They might not have been excited <laughs> to go. But that's the thing, isn't it, Billy? You're quite right. God only reveals just enough, hopefully, to get us moving. Mm -hmm. yeah. If He told us everything, yeah. gosh, if He told us everything, we uh, we give up, right? Yeah. Um, if we overwhelming. So this reflects the nature of God. He's a persevering God, from Eden to the present day, over countless thousands of years. Uh, Jesus tells us in Luke 18 to pray and not give up parable of the persistent widow. Mm -hmm. So here's, a, again, a, a question on, on those lines. Is there something in your life where God is leading you to persevere, to keep exploring and to persevere? Mm -hmm. To keep exploring and persevere. Let me I'll finish off this point and then end a minute before then come back to you. So exploring and persevering, which are closely tied together, and then deciding. Deciding to act. Someone pointed out, they're quick to make the decision. They see the vision, and they get ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We got ready at once. It seems like we concluded. They made a decision. Not just Paul, though Paul is the one who had the vision. Maybe the others had the vision too, we don't know. But Paul had a vision. Looks like they discussed it together. What does this mean? It means we need to go. So they decided and they acted. The word decide comes from a Latin word meaning to cut, or to cut off, or to cut away. So it's like we have all these options, I'm going to cut all those other options away until I'm left with one. And for them, they could have started a church in Troas. They could have waited for the Spirit of Jesus to let them go to Bithynia or Mycenae or somewhere else. They could have prayed a lot more. They could have fasted more. I mean, maybe they did that as well, but they said, no, I'm going to cut all those options away. This is the decision. We're getting on a boat, and we're going to Macedonia. They concluded that. There's something about deciding. There's something about listening. There's something about being patient. There's something about prayer and fasting. And then there's something about deciding. And when God 
allows things in our lives that cause bewilderment, at some point there's usually enough clarity to realize what the next decision is. Okay, I need to decide. I need to act. What decision has God been placing before you recently? Do you have one? Maybe you have a big decision to make. It could be about your life. It could be about your, your, your family's life. It could be about elderly parents. It could be about children. It could be about your career. It could be of all kinds of things. Is there a decision that you're... You know it's there, but you're hesitating to make a decision that's become clear enough. The door is open wide enough to see that that's not the way to go. Yeah. There's a deciding that needs to go on. We have these three things we see here. We have them exploring and continuing to explore, to persevere, to learn what God has got in terms of direction for them, and then they, then they decide. And all three of these things, are not humanistic and mechanistic. They're expressions of faith. They have faith that God has a good plan, therefore they continue to explore. They have faith that God will take them somewhere constructive, so they persevere. They have faith that even though this decision seems a bit strange, but God will do something good with it. And they're all an expression of faith, trusting that God has a purpose. And just to, to wrap up, you know, it's an interesting thing that all these places got their churches in the end. They got them in the end. So in 1 Peter chapter 1, Paul writes to the exiles, the Christians scattered through Bithynia. So Paul wasn't allowed to go at that time, but in time, that's what happened. In Galatia, he wasn't allowed to stay in Galatia, but what happens when Paul writes later to the Christians in Galatia, he writes to the churches in Galatia. In a Troas, where he's just been right now, and there is no church when he's there now, we find that in, sec in Acts, sorry, Acts chapter 20, it says that after five days they joined the others at Troas, where they stayed seven days, they broke bread. It seems that there was a church there. It's also mentioned in 2 Corinthians as well. So it's God, God wanted those people saved. He had a plan. It's just it wasn't the plan that involved Paul and his companions at that time. They had to decide to do what God was guiding them to do and not worry about everything else. And that's one of the things that helps us to make a decision. That we have a decision to make, but God has a bigger plan and He'll take care of the things that we don't understand or we can't get around to right now. They get there in the end. So my summary thought is just to say, I don't like feeling bewildered. I don't like it at all. And I've felt a fair bit of that in my life recently with the changes in Thames Valley and the move to the morning services and that kind of stuff and a few other things. And it's a bit strange. And, you know, we've had our son has moved home, which is, a, is good in many ways, but also a bit bewildering as to what's next for him. And I think he's probably a bit bewildered too, I, expect, I suppose. And there's all these things. And but I suppose at least one of the ways to deal with that sense of bewilderment in your life is to understand that it has at least two blessings. And one is, it makes you pray. It draws us to God. There's nothing, maybe nothing, but quite like what makes us pray more than maybe two things. I think one is wonderment at something astonishing. When you, you see your baby born or something like that, or you see an incredible sunset, you think... You know, that kind of makes us wonder, right? But the other thing that makes us really go, God, please, I need you, is when we're bewildered. Mm -hmm. And there's a deepening in our relationship with God that can happen if we go to God in prayer when we're bewildered. And the second thing that I believe is a, a, a blessing of bewilderment is growth. It's, it's God is helping me grow. God is helping you grow. God is helping us as a church grow when we're not quite sure what he's doing because we have to draw closer to him. And he grows through that. To trust in him, to learn from him, and to find out what, where the open door actually is. Prayer connects us to the Father, and the growth that happens through bewilderment helps us to become more like Jesus. If we see that that is God's purpose.